I'm guessing you're probably familiar with milk and with cheese, but maybe not how exactly a bucket of milk can get transformed into cheese. And that's exactly what I love about food science is it explains how the food around us gets made and produced and usually we take this entirely for granted. So if you've ever been curious, how do we take liquid milk and add just a couple of simple ingredients to transform it into the savory crumbly snack? Here's Cheese Science Explained. living in the Netherlands, I helped teach a course on dairy science. And the best part of this class, or I'd argue the best part, was we got to take a field trip to a Dutch dairy farmer where we made our own Gouda cheese, or Gouda cheese, if you're Dutch, a little more like, a little more throat. And look how adorable these little cheeses turn out. So now that you've seen the end product, these cute little cheese wheels, Let's rewind and go back to the start of the process where we simply have a pail of milk. Now to that bucket of milk, we first need to combine all the necessary ingredients. Luckily, cheese is actually a very simple recipe and the farmer mixed all the ingredients together before we even arrived. Of course, we need our milk. We will add some lactic acid bacteria, also an enzyme called chymosin, and most often you will also add calcium. The reason the farmer combined all the ingredients before we even arrived is that the next step takes about 30 minutes or so to happen. And this is the clotting of the curd or the gelation of the protein network. During this step, a lot of different things start happening at the same time. And to understand each of these, we need a quick crash course about milk's major protein, which is called casein. In milk, caseins form these larger structures that we call casein micelles. So these casein proteins are in these micelles. They have sort of a hairy uh, protein of the casein sort of sticking off of them. And they also have a net negative charge. And both these things, that hairy layer protruding and the negative charge, make sure these casein micelles are very stable. They don't really knock into each other or come together. They like to stay separate. Now let's take a look at those other ingredients we added to see how they each impact casein. The first is that that enzyme chymosin, it starts getting to work in the milk. And what chymosin does is it acts like a scissors and cleaves off those hairs that are protruding from the casein micelles. So that hairy portion, that is actually kappa casein. So these enzymes or the chymosin, it cleaves off part of kappa casein, kind of making the casein micelles almost bald with those hairs removed. And this allows the casein micelles to actually come in contact with one another. So we would say before the hairs resulted in steric hindrance, they sterically did not let casein micelles come together. But now that the casein is more bald, they actually don't mind coming together to form larger aggregates. The second thing that is happening is that those lactic acid bacteria start to get some get up and go. They start to consume that lactose and produce lactic acid. And as more acid is produced, the pH of the milk goes lower and lower as it approaches the isoelectric point of that casein of the protein. Now the isoelectric point is just a fancy word for it's a pH where the casein, that specific protein, has no net charge. Remember I said earlier, casein in milk naturally has a negative charge, but with all that acid produced at that lower pH, those casein micelles are no longer negatively charged, they're neutral. And once they're neutral, this also compels those micelles to come together and form larger aggregates. The third thing that is happening during this clotting step is that the calcium we added, which is positively charged, can help shield some of those negative charges if we're not exactly at the isoelectric point. Said a bit differently, calcium with that plus two charge is able to act like a bridge or a link between two of the negative charges on the casein micelles. So it's these three things happening at once that actually allow the casein micelles that are once stable and individual to come together and form aggregates until these aggregates start to form a protein network. And this protein network, this casein, 
actually gets so strong, it clots so that it can hold in the that liquid whey, the fat globules, the microbes, the enzymes. That protein network holds everything together. Next step is cutting the curd. And I know this seems sort of backwards because we just made the milk gel. Why would we cut it? But this gel is it doesn't really resemble the cheese we know. This gel is very spacious. It has a, like huge pores that hold in all the liquid whey. And actually to get something like cheese, we need to really compress that gel and get rid of a lot of that liquid. I was very excited for this step because I always wanted to use these fancy knives and I never got to before. As the gel is cut, it releases a lot of that liquid whey. It sort of expels it from the gel matrix. And the fancy word for this is called sinuresis. That just means a gel releases a lot of the moisture or the water that it was holding. Now the extent of sinuresis is really important for the final cheese, even though that seems very far away at this point, but it really determines the moisture content of the final cheese and how firm or soft that cheese is. Once we are done cutting the curd, it really, that casein network has really compressed the curd has compressed a lot and we were told to remove most of the whey using a measuring cup. So not very scientific, but it worked. At this point during the process, we took a coffee break and that's for a couple of reasons. One, because Dutch people love a morning coffee break and I also learned to love it too, but also because we needed to give that lactic acid bacteria more time to convert nearly all of the lactose present into lactic acid. And we want to do that before the next couple of steps because that bacteria will be really inhibited and slowed down once we add the salt and the milk is at lower temperatures. But then we're gonna finish the separation step. This was pretty easy. We just want to drain all the excess liquid whey from the cheese curd. And what we're left with at the bottom of our bucket is that cheese curd that is basically that casein protein all connected and forming networks with one another as it holds in a small part of the moisture still or some of that whey, but also fat globules, microbes, you know, all these other smaller components. That casein network is holding it all together. Then we need to add our final ingredient and that is salt or sodium chloride. And typically a final cheese product will be about one to 4% salt. So the salting step here was very simple. The farmer literally came around with like a big bucket of salt and just grabbed a handful and like threw it in. And then we used our hands to mix it in the cheese curd more, a bit more homogeneously. And like this, the farmer must have the feel for how much salt because I almost missed him. He did not measure it out or anything. Just, I almost missed him throwing it in. But more traditionally with Gouda cheese, the salting step would actually be called brining. And that's because you use a 20% salt dissolved in water, like a salt solution. You have this big bath with the brine and you just put the cheese wheels in there and they sort of float around in a pool of salt water. The reason we didn't do this is brining tends to take hours, if not days, for that salt to sort of diffuse into the cheese. So it's much slower, where during the field trip, we only had a couple of hours. So we just tossed in salt crystals like you might have at home. Salt is added for a couple of reasons during cheese making. Probably most obviously is that it affects the taste or the flavor of the cheese but also salt always helps in food products with preservation. It helps to control what bacteria grow, how fast the product is allowed to spoil, and it really helps to extend the shelf life of a food. Now it's time for shaping that cheese curd into that cute little wheel shape. And we're using those white molds, maybe you saw them laying on the table. And this was a pretty hands-on process. We just took a chunk of that cheese curd, stuffed it into the white mold until it was full, you know, put the top on, and you can see some of that whey is still draining out. And after we had a full cheese mold, we stacked them up to go through the pressing step. The pressing machine here is pretty simple. We are just loading some weights onto those cheese molds to press out or expel a little more of that liquid whey. But what is really important during this pressing step is that it starts to form an outer rind or really closes 
the outer surface of that cheese curd so that it's very difficult for something to get in. It would be difficult for spoilage bacteria or something to contaminate the interior of the cheese because we fused that rind shut, that outer surface shut. The pressing step also helps make sure that once released from the mold, the cheese still keeps that shape because with that added weight pressing on the cheese, the cheese curds sort of fuse together. They deform so they used to be individual cheese curd and they sort of deform and fuse together to make that larger cheese wheel that will keep its shape even for weeks, months, or years. Okay, we made it to the final step of the cheese making process, which is the ripening or the aging of the cheese. Unfortunately, this is also the most complicated step or the, uh, it's just not well understood. But the ripening is important because this is where the cheese develops all of its flavor, the real characteristic flavor of the cheese but also takes its final, you know, appearance, its final consistency. So this really is what determines what a consumer sees and buys at the grocery store. In general, cheese is aged just in a cheese room with, you know, shelves and shelves of wheels of cheese. It's held around 16 degrees Celsius, which for you Americans, that's about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, so a little cooler than room temperature, and it's held at that lower temperature to really inhibit spoilage microorganisms from growing and ruining the cheese. I would say all cheese should at least be aged for six to eight weeks at the minimum to get some flavor development. Really, if you see cheese in the grocery store and it's a young cheese, I would say that's been aged for eight weeks. Of course, cheese can be aged for, I don't know, up to 10, 20 years, right? You can, you can age cheese for a very long time. But like I mentioned, this ripening, this, this step where the flavors really develop is quite complex because a lot of enzymatic reactions and chemical reactions are taking place in the same time. And that's because cheese develops its flavor as the proteins or the fat are broken down into smaller and smaller molecules. It's these small molecules that are flavor molecules, not the larger proteins or fat. And what's breaking down these molecules are enzymes that we specifically added to the cheese, or maybe they originated in the milk in the first place. We could also have some bacterial enzymes because we added lactic acid bacteria or maybe there were bacteria that were present in the milk from the beginning, they would also have enzymes. So that's what I mean. It's, it's very complex because these enzymes are converting different molecules, chemical reactions are taking place, but really over time as large molecules like fats and proteins get broken down to smaller and smaller molecules, this is what develops the flavor in the cheese. About eight weeks later, I finally tried my own cheese and it tasted, well, like cheese. It, it wasn't the best cheese I've ever had because if I could choose, I'd want like a super aged cheddar that is like crumbly and brittle and has those like crunchy cheese crystals. But it was the cheese that I made with my own two hands and that was pretty cool.